Thank you. Thank you, Holly Peters, for helping me <laughs> there. Well, I have to tell you, students, I know you are just kind of surprised as I am that when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So in History 2, 1877, I'm not for sure where I stopped in both classes. So I'm going to... Uh, kind of go back to Washington's first cabinet, as you can tell, Attorney General Edmund Randolph, Secretary of State Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, the man with the knowledge of how to make money, and Henry Knox, Secretary of War. And Hamilton, as you well know, uh, this was the guy that was Jefferson's second in command and also was the one that went and uh, helped uh, at Princeton and, you know, to give the morale boost. You had Trenton and Princeton, I'm sorry, uh, Trenton there. And so, uh, with Hamilton, there's the five-point plan, and listen carefully, because this is what he presented to Congress. And Confederation, both foreign, which is 12 million, and 42 million to American citizens, so you can see it's uh, 54 million dollars. So he presents this, it passed. Uh, then let's take the second one. This is controversial, and I'll tell you why. Assume the debts of the state, 21.5 million, and I won't be quizzing on how much they're paying back, but listen carefully because you will see this on a quiz. The Bank of the United States, a protective tariff, and a excise tax on whiskey. Now, the only one that did not pass was that one right there. Everything else passed. Now, let me tell you what's interesting about this, is that there's two future presidents that are opposed to the five-point plan. So, Let's take Hamilton, and he says a limited national debt was beneficial, okay? So he firmly believes that we need to pay the money back to the people, okay? So we're going to pay it back, which he's talking about, one and two, okay? Particularly one, for example, okay? So... Let me give you now the uh, guys that are opposition to this. Madison and Jefferson, okay? Let me tell you what's happening now. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, two future presidents, are bugging out about the five-point plan. Here's Madison's problem is number one. Okay, so let's go back to number one here. And let's say, since I don't have any students in this classroom, I'm going to have to use myself and Todd Shepard. Let's say that Todd Shepard loaned money to the government of $5,000 worth of bonds. And so here I come, and Todd Shepard loaned $5,000 worth of bonds uh, to the government, bought bonds rather, and I told Todd Shepard that the new government's not going to uh, pay back 
that $5,000, Todd, that you loan the government. But here's what I'll do. I'll give you $2,500 for your $5,000. And Todd Shepard's thinking, interesting. I will take your money. So I gave him $2,500. Madison's angry with me because I lied to Todd Shepard saying that the government would not pay the loans back. So that's why he's upset. And then let me give you this one. Jefferson has an issue with number two and number three. So let's go back. Here's the problem, okay? So the southern states, they had already started cutting their debt down. Northern states had not even dealt with it the state's debts in the North. So when it came time to vote on number two, it failed. So Hamilton goes to Jefferson and he says to Jefferson, if you can persuade the South to support the assumption bill, number two, I'll persuade the North to allow the building of the nation's capital in the South. And so, guess what? The second time they voted on it, it passed. Barely, but passed. That's how you got the nation's capital where it's at. Then there's the third part. Jefferson's got a problem with the Bank of the United States, okay? So, let's take this part, the blueprint. So listen carefully, even though you're not in this room, I'm going to visualize your listening at your home and drinking a cup of coffee or eating a donut there. The blueprint, startup cost is $10 million, okay? So the federal government is going to contribute $2 million. That gives them one-fifth ownership. Then the rest of the money is going to come from people who are wealthy. So the remaining four-fifths, you're going to buy at $450, I'm sorry, $400 a share, 20,000 shares. And that's the reason. Jefferson doesn't like the idea of the bank. Now we get into this big fight over the Bank of the United States. So here it is. This is Jefferson's argument. Nothing in the Constitution gives the government power to start a bank. In my government classes, there's three powers of the Constitution. There's the express powers, the inherent powers, and the implied powers. This is an express power. Jefferson says you cannot start a bank. It's not listed in the Constitution. So in my government classes, I always tell that if it's black and white, it's this. It means it's an express power. But Jefferson, this is his argument. It's not in black and white. Well, so let's take, that's what he's talking about. Strict construction is this, express power. Okay. Now you try to tell Mr. Conservative, Alexander Hamilton, that's what I called him at the Constitutional Convention, he's gonna say, hold on, absolutely you don't need it in the Constitution. 
Hamilton's argument is this. It's called loose construction. It means the elastic clause of the Constitution. In my government classes, I talk about the gray color. I like to color code things. Expressed as black and white, uh, elastic is gray, it's loose construction, which basically means this, that Congress shall make all laws necessary and proper. So when you see loose construction here, it's part of this. The necessary and proper clause. All right, now, so as you know that you will be used having a test next week in both of my History 21877 classes. Uh, remember, it's gonna be a time quiz. You'll get the same amount of time that I give a face-to-face -face quiz. And you will have a time quiz, which is no different than if you're taking it in class. So I want to refresh your memory. So the bank battle passed. The only one that did not pass uh, of the have five-point plan was the excise tax. All right, so what do we get with Hamilton's five-point plan? Well, we get money. We're now going to get money established. All right, we're going to get the rise of political parties. I'm going to try to see if I can't squeeze that in a little bit more for you. I don't kind of hard to do that there. Uh, you also going to get Hamilton's followers are going to be Federalist. Okay. Hamilton's group are all Federalist. All right. Now, what else do we get with Hamilton's plan? Oh, look. We get the very test case for George Washington's administration. Farmers in Western Pennsylvania were furious about the excise tax. So they started beating up the people who were what I call being rednecks. And so Washington put on his uniform, but he actually sent Henry Knox. Well, by the time Knox got to Western Pennsylvania, the Whiskey Rebellion was over there. So uh, this was George Washington's test case. And let me tell you, the man is being tested during his presidency there. All right, with Hamilton's plan, you get He's very much pro-British, all right? Hamilton is pro-British, okay? Uh, you'll also see he favors a strong national government. Hamilton favors a strong national government. And naturally, hello, favors the rich. and this, the loose construction of the Constitution, okay? There. Now, well, with Hamilton's plan, well, let's look at why Jefferson. Those are two opposite people. It's kind of like Donald Trump and Barack Obama, two different kinds of presidents there, okay? So Jefferson is very much pro-French. Not only is he pro-French, but he's a big supporter of agriculture. 
Jefferson once said, if God had a chosen people, it would be people in agriculture. All right. And strict construction of the Constitution. There you see it. Strict construction of the Constitution. And if you are a supporter of Jefferson, well, that party is still around today. Back then, you were a Jeffersonian Republican. Today, you are Democrats, which you are currently trying to find out who's going to be the Democratic nominee for president when it comes time to have an election during this corona crisis here. All right. So let's take Washington's problems here. You've got to feel sorry for this guy. First of all, Washington's got a lot of problems. So one of his problems was that right there, the French Revolution, 1789. The French people have revolted. They are whacking the heads off. Marie Antoinette, her husband Louis, anybody that was anyone of nobility got your head whacked off by the guillotine, which was a safer way of execution instead of using a ax there. So when that happens, and then look what happens next. War breaks out between France and England. Okay, this all gonna go back to what I mentioned last week or whenever we had it, that 1778 treaty after the Battle of Saratoga. This is gonna cause problems for George. Gonna be problems for Jefferson and Hamilton. So here's what happens next. In 1793, Washington says, we're not strong enough to help in this fight between the French and the British. He issues neutrality proclamation. That goes over like a puppy peeing on a rug here. So he issues neutrality proclamation and look who's pee, owed, France. France is angry because we, they helped us. They're expecting us to help them. We're not helping them. And George does this because it is in the best interest of the United States. So let's look at this. How did the French react to the neutrality proclamation? So again, how does the French react to the neutrality proclamation? Well, they did something unheard of. They send, they're angry, and so they're gonna send a guy by the name of Edmond Genet. E-D-M-O-N-D, Genet, G-E-N-E-T, the new French ambassador. Okay, he is sent from France to the United States, and he actually doesn't show his credentials to George Washington. Instead, he does something really out of the ordinary. Genet hires a bunch of pirates, privateers, and what they started doing is that they were hired to capture British ships and bring them into American ports. Now, France is wanting Britain to think that we're siding with the French. So over 80 ships were captured. Well, in the meantime, 
France does this to us by taking the British ships and putting them in American ports, the British, they issue, they retaliate with what is called impressment. Impressment means to force Americans into the service of the British Navy. So they would capture American sailors and force them into the Royal Navy. Oh my God. So now you got that, forcing them into the Royal Navy. So when a French ship captures a British ship, look what happens. They're gonna find Americans on the British ships. Oh, so eventually, Genet does go and predict presents his credentials to Washington, and George Washington said, I'm going to send you back to Paris, France. And Genet said, oh, gosh, don't do that, because uh, my party's lost control, and I will be executed. So Washington basically says, we'll let you stay, but stop the nonsense. Well, here's what happens. Jefferson felt like we should honor the treaty. Hamilton says we don't need to honor the treaty because it's, non, it's null and void. Because A, it was signed between the French monarchy and under the Articles of Confederation. And Hamilton says they don't exist anymore. So that was Hamilton's argument. Hamilton's really got George's ear. Uh, George likes Alexander Hamilton, and it really drives Washington, cra I mean, uh, Jefferson crazy. So if you're George Washington, the one thing you're going to do is send a guy to London to see if we can't get the British to stop impressment. So he sends a guy by the name of John Jay. So John Jay's job is to go to England and try to get them to stop impressment, forcing sailors, or sorry, forcing Americans into the service of the British Navy. All right, so what happens next? John Jay goes to England, to London, and we get Jay's treaty, and here's the terms of the treaty. A, looky there. The British would evacuate the frontier forts. Oh, my God, they were supposed to do that after the Revolutionary War. They didn't do it. B, the second part. Oh, looky there. The United States would pay pre-war debts to British merchants. Okay. Then, look at number three, or C, whichever one you're, impressment was never resolved. So guess what? The British came out on top of Jay's treaty. When Jay brings the treaty back, he has to present it to the Senate. The Senate has to approve all treaties. When the Senate got word of what was in the treaty, they were not going to pass it. George Washington had to walk across over to Congress, to the United States Senate, and get them and told them, and talk to them, and they passed Jay's treaty. Well, what's funny, since this was a negative for us, it actually leads to a positive situation. And here it is. The Jay's Treaty, what we get with Jay's Treaty 
is that it delayed war between the United States and the British, okay? But let me jump down to 1796, called Pickney's Treaty. And it's between the United States and Spain. And this is kind of an interesting story. When Spain found out that the United States was going to England to sign a treaty, they were afraid that the United States and England were going to team up and take the Louisiana Territory. So, you know, under the Articles of Confederation, remember, Spain would not allow us to use the Mississippi River. So, Pitney's Treaty, here's what we get. Under Pitney's Treaty, we get the use of the Mississippi River. Americans can now use the Mississippi River before they couldn't. And we don't have to pay a a deposit tax. We do not have to pay a deposit tax uh, under this agreement. So, and one other thing about Pickney's Treaty, we got a boundary dispute settled between Georgia and Florida, in which we got more territory there. So we finally settled this, because remember it's Spanish Florida and now Georgia, so we got that settled. So it was quite entertaining uh, how one country thinks that we should, uh, uh, thought that we were gonna gang up and take the Mississippi River, but we didn't. All right, so let's do it this way. George Washington has served two four-year terms. He has decided to retire, okay? So in 1796, George Washington has decided to retire. So this is the man that set up the two-term tradition for all presidents until FDR broke it in the, when he ran for a third term. So these are George Washington's, this is a short synopsis of his farewell speech. The high points is this, he did not like political parties. He's turning over in his grave today to see how this has taken place about Republicans and Democrats, how we can't get along. He, off, he went on to say we need to maintain unity and have a strong national government there. This is a guy that had no one to talk to other than his cabinet. And this is the guy that actually got our Constitution working, which again, he's turning over in his grave how the Constitution is under attack today. And he warned about alliances with foreign countries. Yes, warned against the dangers of alliances with foreign countries. So George Washington is retiring and going back to Mount Vernon, where he will be able to farm, make whiskey. So now it takes us to the presidential election of 1796. In that presidential election of 1796, the candidate of the Federalist Party was John Adams. First, 
So John Adams, the first vice president. And so Federalist is a Hamilton party. And his running mate was Thomas Pickney. Okay. And Jeffersonian Republicans, Thomas Jefferson being the presidential candidate, he picked Aaron Burr. So in 1796, in this election, it got quite nasty. But what happened in the 1796 election? Well, when the votes were cast and what happened is that the Electoral College met and they would write down on a piece of paper, Adams or Jefferson. And when they votes, whoever got the most votes is president. The one that gets the second most votes is vice president. Only this time we get this one right here. Adams got 71 electoral votes. Jefferson got 68 electoral votes. So we've got Adams who is a Federalist, Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican or Jeffersonian Republican, and lo and behold, Jefferson was basically ostracized. It would be like Trump being president and then Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders being vice president. So Jefferson's vice president, and he's basically ostracized. Matter of fact, Jefferson, who was Secretary of State, but after the, he got mad over the part about not supporting the French, he quit. And so Jefferson's not even gonna be asked about anything. So let's take what we get with John Adams and trivia. So, we won't spend a lot of time on trivia, but at least remember some things. First, there he is. He is the first guy to live in the White House, okay? He also was one of two presidents to sign the Declaration of Independence. So again, you know, and he was, uh, uh, so let's take what happens with John Adams and his administration. All right, so let's do it this way. He's got the same problems that Jed Washington had. Impressment. The British are continuing to impress the uh, American sailor. The French, oh my gosh, look, France is threatening to hang Americans found on British ships. So it's kind of like we're in between a rock and a hard place. How do we do handle this? Well, we don't. So Adams is going to kind of need some, a way to figure out how to get France to leave us alone and not hang our soldiers, our sailors rather. So this is what Adams does. He sends two guys, Elbridge Jerry and John Marshall, are gonna go to Paris, France to meet Charles Pickney, okay? So I like to always say that Adams probably said something like this in a letter. You are cordially invited to represent the United States in negotiations in Paris, France, 
to meet with Charles, uh, to meet with Charles Pigney, who's the American ambassador. And your job is you three Americans are going to meet with Charles Talleyrand. Charles Talleyrand is the guy, he is the French foreign minister. So Talleyrand is the guy that can put a stop to threatening to hang Americans on ships. So it's, it takes about three to four weeks on a ship to get to Paris, France. Pigney's probably marking it on a calendar. So when Jerry, Elbridge Jerry and John Marshall arrive in Paris, France, Charles Pickney was there to meet him. Well, as they're getting off the ship, I would assume that Pickney probably said, well, how was your trip? And Marshall and Jerry probably said, oh, it's long and boring. Well, what happens next is the three guys were to go meet Talleyrand. Instead, three Frenchmen meet the Americans. So these three French dudes arrive and they run into the Americans and the Americans are going, okay, hi, how are you? And the French, three French guys are saying, if you want to meet Talleyrand, you better do this. Pay a bribe to key members of the French government. You're to pay a bribe to key members of the French government. Guess who it is? It's the three French guys, okay? You're going to pay us some money. On the other side, you're going to have to loan several million dollars to the French government. And so that's what was said. Now, we didn't pay him a bribe. We didn't loan several million dollars to the French government. And people are always saying, well, who were the three French guys? We called them Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z, which leads us to be what is called the XYZ affair. Boy. When word reaches back, when the Americans go back to the United States, whoa, the United States government created the Department of the Navy. We increased the size of the armed forces. This XYZ affair is what is called an undeclared war, which means a state of war exists. And now politicians overreact when we do these things. So Adam's party is going to overreact to what is about to take place. Now, I'm going to end with that part and I will pick up there in a day or two. So keep your eyes on Blackboard, okay? Have a good day.